Hi, my name is Talia Gershon, and I'm a scientist at IBM Research. Today I've been challenged to explain a topic with five levels of increasing complexity. It's a completely different kind of computing called quantum computing. Quantum computers approach solving problems in a fundamentally new way. And we hope that by taking this new approach to computation, we'll be able to start exploring some problems that we could never solve any other way. Hopefully by the end of today, everyone can leave this discussion understanding quantum computing at some level. What's this? Yeah, what do, you, what do you think that is? Fancy chandelier. I think so too. We jokingly call it the chandelier. That's real gold, you know. This is a quantum computer. It's a quantum? Yeah, it's a really special kind of computer. What does it do? It calculates things, but in a totally different way to how your computer calculates things. What do you think this is? A. Yeah. Do you know what your computer thinks that is? Zero and one. <laughs> this really specific combination of zeros and ones. Everything that your computer does, showing you Pink Panther videos on YouTube, calculating things, searching the internet, it does all of that with a really specific combination of zeros and ones, which is crazy, right? That would be like saying, your computer only understands these quarters. For each quarter, you need to tell it that you're gonna use heads, tails, and you assign it heads or tails. So I can switch between heads and tails and I can switch the zeros and ones in my computer so that it represents what I want it to represent like an A. And with quantum computers, we have new rules we get to use too. We can actually spin one of our quarters. Uh, so it doesn't have to choose just one or the other. Can computers help you with um, your homework, your really hard homework? Yeah, they can, especially if doing your homework involves calculating something or finding information. But what if your homework was to discover something totally new? A lot of those discovery questions are much harder to solve using the computers we have today. So the reason we're building these kinds of computers is because we think that maybe one day they're gonna do a lot of really important things like help us understand nature better. Maybe help us create new medicines to help people. What's your favorite kind of computer? Smartphone, tablet, regular, laptop, PC? I've gotta go with my iPhone. So what do you do with your iPhone? Social media, um, use it for your studying. Have you ever run out of space on your iPhone? All the time. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> yeah, always when I'm trying to take a photo. So did you know that there are certain kinds of problems that computers sort of run out of space almost? Like you're trying to solve the problem and just like how you run out of space on your iPhone when you're trying to take a picture, if you're trying to solve the problem, you just run out of space. And even if you have the world's biggest supercomputer, did you know that can still happen? Wow. So my team is working on building new kinds of computers all together, ones that operate by a totally different set of rules. So do you know what that is? I have no <laughs> clue. It's a quantum computer. A what? <laughs> <laughs> have you ever heard of a quantum computer? I haven't. Have you ever heard of the word quantum? No. Okay, so quantum mechanics is a branch of science, just like any other branch of science. It's a branch of physics. It's the study of things that are either really, really small, really, really well isolated, or really, really cold. And this particular branch of science is something we're using to totally reimagine how computing works. So we're building totally new kinds of computers based on the laws of quantum mechanics. That's what a quantum computer is. Huh. I'm gonna start by telling you about something called superposition. So I'm gonna explain it using this giant penny. Wow. That's, is that like worth a hundred pennies? I don't know what it's worth, but uh, I can put it face up, right? And that's heads. I can put it face down, right? So at any given time, point in time, if I ask you, is my penny heads or tails? Probably you could answer it, right? Yeah. Okay. But what if I spin the penny? Hmm. So let's do it. Okay. So while it's spinning, is it heads or tails? Heads. While it's spinning? Oh, it, I wouldn't know. It's sort, of, it's sort of a combination of heads and yeah, tails, yeah. right? Would you say? So superposition is this idea that my penny is not just either heads or tails. It's in this state, which is a combination of heads and tails. And this quantum property is something that we can have in real, real physical objects in the world. So that's superposition. And the second thing that we'll talk about is called entanglement. So now I'm going to give you a penny. Wow! <laughs> when we use the word entangled in everyday language, what do we mean? That 
Something's intertwined or... Exactly, that there's two things that are connected in some way, and usually we can separate them again. Yeah. If your hair is tangled or whatever, you can, you can unentangle it, right? Yeah. But in the quantum world, when we entangle things, they're really now connected. It's much, much harder to separate them mm -hmm. again. So using the same analogy, we okay. spin our pennies and eventually... <laughs> eventually they both stop, right? And when they stop, it's either heads or tails, right? Mm -hmm. So in my case, I got tails and you got heads. You see how they're totally disconnected from each other, right? Mm -hmm. Our pennies in the yeah. real world. Now, if our pennies were entangled and we both spun them together, right? When we stop them, if you measured your penny to be a head, I would measure my penny to be a head. And if you measured your penny to be a tails, I would measure my penny to be a tails. If we measured it at exactly the same time, we would still find that they were both exactly correlated. That's crazy. That's so cool, right? Oh my god. The way that we are able to actually see these quantum properties is by making our quantum chips really, really cold. So that's what this is all about, actually. This is called a dilution refrigerator, and it's a refrigerator. It doesn't look like a normal refrigerator, right? But it's something that we use. Actually, there's usually a case around it to cool our quantum chips down cold enough that we can create superpositions and we can entangle qubits, and the information isn't lost to the environment. Like, what could those chips be used to do? So one of the things that we're trying to use quantum computers to do is simulating chemical bonding. Use a quantum system to model a quantum system. Yeah, I mean, I'm definitely gonna impress all my friends when I tell them about this. They're gonna be like, quantum what? <laughs> so, what do you think that thing is? Is it some sort of conductor circuit? That is a really good guess. There's parts of that that are definitely about conducting. This is the inside of a quantum computer. Oh, wow. <laughs> Yeah, this whole infrastructure is all about creating levels that get progressively colder as you go from top to bottom down to the quantum chip, which is how we actually control the state of the qubits. Oh, wow. So when you say colder, you mean like physically colder? Yeah, like physically colder. So room temperature is 300 Kelvin. As you get down all the way to the bottom of the fridge, it's at 10 milli Kelvin. Oh, wow. Yeah. Amanda, what do you study? So I'm studying computer science, currently a sophomore, and the track that I'm in is the intelligent systems track. Machine learning, artificial intelligence. Have you ever heard of quantum computing? From my understanding, with a quantum computer rather than using transistors, is using spins. You can have superposition of spins, so different states. Um, more combinations means more memory. So that's pretty good. <laughs> so you mentioned superposition, but you can also use other quantum properties like entanglement. Have you heard of entanglement? I have not. Okay, so it's this idea that you have two objects and when you entangle them together, they become connected. Oh, okay. and, and then they're sort of permanently connected to each other and they behave in ways that are sort of a system now. So superposition is one quantum property that we use. Entanglement is another quantum property and a third is interference. How much do you know about interference? Um, not much. Okay, so how do noise cancelling headphones work? Um, they read like wavelength, ambient wavelengths and then produce like the opposite one to cancel out. They create interference. So you can have constructive interference and you can have destructive interference. If you have constructive interference, you have amplitudes, wave amplitudes that add, mm -hmm. so the, the signal gets larger. And if you have destructive interference, the amplitudes cancel. By using a property like interference, we can control quantum states and amplify the kinds of signals we, that are towards the right answer and then cancel the types of signals that are leading to the wrong answer. So given that you know that we're trying to use superposition, entanglement, and interference for computation, how do you think we build these computers? I have no idea. <laughs> so step one is you need to be able to have an object or physical device, we call it a qubit or quantum bit, that can actually handle those things, can actually be put into superpositions of states you know, two qubit states that you can physically entangle with each other. That's not really trivial, right? Mm -hmm. and things in our classical world, you can't really entangle things in our classical world so easily. We need to use devices where they can, they can support a quantum state and we can manipulate that quantum state. Atoms, ions, and in our case, superconducting qubits. We make qubits out of superconducting materials. But as like a programmer, how would quantum computing affect a different way of writing a program? It's a perfect question. I mean, it's very early for quantum computing, but we're building assembly languages. We're building layers of abstraction that are gonna get you to a point as a programmer where you can interchangeably be programming something the way that you already do, and then make calls to a quantum computer so that you can bring it in when it makes sense. We're not envisioning quantum computers completely replacing classical computers anytime soon. We think that quantum computing is gonna be used to accelerate the kinds of things that are really hard for, for classical machines. So what exactly are some of those problems? 
simulating nature is something that's really hard because if you take something like you know, modeling atomic bonding and electronic orbital overlap. Instead of now writing out a giant simulation over many terms, you try and actually mimic the system you're trying to simulate directly on a quantum computer, which we can do for chemistry. And uh, we're looking at ways of doing that for other types of things. There's a lot of exciting research right now on machine learning, trying to use quantum systems to accelerate machine learning problems. So would it be <laughs> like in five years or 10 years that I would be able to have like one of these sitting in my laptop just in my dorm? I don't think you're gonna have one in your dorm room anytime soon, but you'll have access to one. There's three free quantum computers that are all sitting in this lab here that anyone in the world can access through the cloud. Okay, <laughs> so quantum computing creates new possibilities and new ways to approach problems that classical computers have difficulty doing. Couldn't have said it better myself. So I'm a first year master's student and I'm studying machine learning. So it's in the computer science department, but it mixes computer science with math and probability and statistics. So have you come up upon sort of any limits to machine learning? Certainly, depending on the complexity of your model, uh, then computational speed is one thing. I have colleagues here that tell me it can take up to weeks to train certain neural networks, right? Sure, yeah. <clears throat> and actually machine learning is one research direction where we're really hoping that we're going to find um, key parts of the machine learning computation that can be sped up using quantum computing. Yeah, it's exciting. So in a classical computer, you know, you have all sorts of logical gates that perform operations and they uh, change an input to some sort of output, but I guess it's not immediately obvious how you do that with quantum computers. If you think about even just classical information like bits, right? At the end of the day, when you store a bit in your hard drive, there's a magnetic domain <laughs> and you have a magnetic polarization, right? Sure. You can change the magnetization to be pointing up or pointing down, right? Yeah. Quantum systems, we're still manipulating a device and changing the quantum state of that, of that device. You can imagine if it's a spin, that you could have okay. spin up and spin down, sure. but you can also, if you isolate it enough, you can have a superposition of up and down. Sure. So what we do when we try to solve problems with a quantum computer is we encode parts of the problem we're trying to solve into a complex quantum state. And then we manipulate that state to drive it towards what will eventually represent the solution. So how do we actually uh, encode it to start with? Yeah, that's a really good question. This actually <laughs> is a model of the inside of one of our quantum computers. Okay. So you need a chip with qubits. Mm -hmm. Each qubit is a carrier of quantum information. And the way we control the state of that qubit is using microwave pulses. And you send them all the way down these cables, and we've calibrated these microwave pulses so that we know exactly this kind of pulse with this frequency and this duration will put the qubit into superposition, okay. or will flip the state of the qubit from zero to one. Or if we apply a microwave pulse between two qubits, we can entangle them. How do we measure Yes, it? exactly, also through microwave signals. Okay. The key is to come up with algorithms where the result is deterministic. Interesting, so what do those algorithms look like? There's sort of two main classes of quantum algorithms. There's algorithms which were developed for decades, right? Things like Shor's algorithm, which is for factoring, Grover's algorithm for unstructured search, and these algorithms were designed assuming that you had a perfect fault-tolerant quantum computer, which is many decades away. So we're currently in a phase where we're exploring what can we do with these near-term quantum computers, and the answer is gonna be, well, we need different kinds of algorithms to really even explore that question. Yeah, certainly having a search algorithm is very useful. Um, factoring, those are definitely useful things that I would imagine could be done a lot faster on a quantum computer. Yeah, they also unfortunately require fault tolerance. Right sure. now, the algorithms that we know of today to do those things um, on a quantum computer require you to have millions of error corrected qubits. Today we're at like 50, and we're, we're, it's, a, it's actually amazing that we're at 50. There's things that we know or we have strong reason to believe um, are gonna be faster to do on a quantum computer. And then there's things that we'll discover just by virtue of having one. Sure. How could someone like me who's a grad student uh, get involved in this or what kinds of challenges are you facing that someone like me could help out with? I'm glad you're interested. <laughs> I think the place where lots of people can get involved right now is by going and trying it out and thinking about what they could do with it. There's a lot of opportunity to find these near-term applications that are only gonna be found by trying things out. I'm a theoretical physicist. I started out in condensed matter theory, the theory that studies 
superconductors and magnets, and I had to learn a new field of quantum optics and apply those ideas. One of the nice things about being a theorist is you get to keep learning new things. So Steve, tell me about your research and the work you've been doing in quantum computing. My main focus right now is quantum error correction and trying to understand this concept of fault tolerance, which everybody thinks they know it when they see it, but nobody in the quantum case can precisely um, define it. It's something that we've already figured out for classical computing. Like something that amazes me is all the parallels between what we're going through now for quantum computing and what we went through for classical computing. I was asking a computer scientist recently where to read about fault tolerance in classical computing. He said, oh, they don't teach that in computer science <laughs> classes anymore because the hardware has become so reliable. In a quantum system, when you look at it or make measurements, it, it can change in a way that's beyond your control. We have the following task. Build a nearly perfect computer out of a whole bunch of imperfect parts. <laughs> Common myth. How many qubits do you have? That's the only thing that matters. Or just add more qubits. What's the big deal? Pattern them on your chip. The great power of a quantum computer is also its Achilles heel, that it's very, very sensitive to perturbations and noise and environmental effects. You're just uh, multiplying your problems if all you're doing <laughs> is adding uh, qubits. Exactly. So I think something that frustrates a lot of people about quantum computing is the concept of decoherence, right? You can only keep your information quantum for so long, right? And that limits how many operations you can do in a row before you lose your information. That's the challenge, I would say. As much progress as we've made, it's a frustration to still be facing it. Let's talk about some of the things we think need to happen between now and fully fault-tolerant quantum computers to get us to that reality. I mean, there's so many things that need to happen. In my mind, one of the things we need to do is build all these different layers of abstraction that make it easier for programmers to yeah. come in and just enter at the ground level. You know? Yeah, exactly. So I think there's going to be a kind of co-evolution of the hardware and the software up here and the sort of middleware and the whole stack. Another common myth. In the next five years, quantum computing will solve climate change cancer, right? <laughs> right. In the next five years, there'll be tremendous progress in the field, but people really have to understand that we're either at the vacuum tube or transistor <laughs> stage. We're trying to invent the integrated circuit and scale up. It's still very, very, very early in the development of the field. One last myth I think we should bust, Steve. Quantum computers are on the verge of breaking into your bank account and breaking encryption and <laughs> cryptography. There does exist an algorithm, Shor's algorithm, which has been proven mathematically that if you had a large enough quantum computer, you could find the prime factors of large numbers, the basis of the RSA encryption. It's the most commonly used thing uh, on the internet. First, we're far away from uh, being able to have a quantum computer big enough to execute Shor's algorithm on that scale. Second, there are plenty of other encryption schemes that don't use factoring, and I don't think anybody has to be concerned at the moment. And in the end, quantum mechanics goes to the side of privacy enhancement. If you have a quantum communication channel, you can encode information and send it through there, and it's provably secure based on the laws of physics. You know, now that everybody around the world can access a quantum computer through the cloud, people are doing all kinds of cool things. They're building games. We've seen right. the emergence of quantum games, right? <laughs> what do you think people want to do with them? I have no idea what people are going to end up using them for. I mean, if you had gone back 30 years and handed somebody an iPhone, they would have called you a wizard. So <laughs> things are going to happen that we just can't foresee. So I hope you enjoyed that foray into the field of quantum computing. I know I've personally enjoyed getting to see quantum computing through other people's eyes, coming at it from all these different levels. This is such an exciting time in the history of quantum computing. Only in the last couple years have real quantum computers become available to everyone around the world. This is the beginning of a many decade adventure where we'll discover so many things about quantum computing and what it will do. We don't even know all the amazing things it's going to do, and to me that's the most exciting part. 